Welcome and let's turn to the book of Revelation chapter 2 as we continue our study in this wonderful book. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labour, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, for, uh, and for thy name's sake hast laboured, uh, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or as I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. May the Lord richly bless the reading of his word. This book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming victor, is pictured. And the key verse is, uh, I suppose, part of the hinge of these next uh, visions that John sees or the things that he had to write down. Because in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19, that key verse says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. In chapter 1 we see the things that were, the things that he had seen, the things from the past. And in chapters 2 and 3 we see those things which are the church age, if you like. And then in chapter 4 and on we see those things which will come to pass. That's the future. And we are in the present. And we're looking at the seven churches of Asia. And I believe that these were and were written to these seven churches, actual churches that were in existence in the day of John. And he was writing to them write these things. And it was to those specific churches, but not just to them, but to all the churches of God. I ask you this question, looking at churches today, if you were going to look for a church, if you were on holidays or you were moving and you were going somewhere, what would you be looking for in a church? So I tell you now that there is a great difference between churches. They're not all the same. And even those churches that, have, uh, that hold to the same doctrine, they practice in a different way to what we do. And that's okay if it's the Word of God. If it's just practice, that's, that's one thing, but doctrine is another issue. Where do you draw the line as far as doctrine is concerned? Again, different churches have strengths and weaknesses that differ to ours. We have some strengths and we have weaknesses as well. And uh, how do we address those? Well, John, in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelations, is addressing those things seven churches of Asia. Each of these churches was on a, an interconnecting road that was a, a kind of circuit and um, uh, each had heard uh, the, the message of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, there were saved men and women in those cities that had formed churches and that's who Paul is writing to. This was a uh, a message that was written to specific churches. Each name, each city, each church is identified. Each name is significant. 
Each city was significant and the, the problems that were going on in those cities. So it's good to study them. Uh, the order with which they were presented was significant. And uh, that becomes evident when you think about that not only is it to individual churches, not only is it to individuals that these things are being preached, we'll look at that in a minute, but also it talks about uh, possibly the stages of Christendom uh, that those different churches represent. Now I do have one small issue with that, in that if all these stages had to take place, uh, then there was no imminency in the first stage of the Lord Jesus Christ's return. So was Jesus Christ's return imminent for those believers? Yes, it was. Did it happen? No. But we see that um, we have these different stages and they seem to, when you study them, seem to fit very well with those stages and we'll look at that at a further date possibly. But each one of those churches is addressed by name and it's significant and the order is significant. There is a pattern to the, the address. First of all, Jesus Christ's character is revealed to those churches in a different way. The church is commended for the good things that it does, with two exceptions. Sardis and Laodicea don't have a, a commendation. Then there is a condemnation except for two churches. Smyrna and Philadelphia are not condemned by the Lord. Then the church is counseled on those things that needed to be addressed. Then there is a call to commitment and then there is a compensation, if you like, a promise to the overcomers. Each one of these addresses has these. And so we see these things, but we also need to realise that these addresses are to the individual people sitting in the churches, to the individual members, because churches are made up of individuals. If you have a look, uh, in verse uh, 7, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Did you know that same sentence is, used at the end of each one of the addresses to the churches. He that had an ear to hear, let him hear. And so it is to the individuals. We can put into practice those things that we learn uh, in these addresses to the churches in our personal lives as well as our corporate lives as a church. And it's a needful thing. If we are honest with ourselves and if we are honest with God, there are positive things in our lives that we can develop and foster and improve upon. But there are also negative areas in our lives that we need to forsake and leave behind. We need to confess them to God and we need to move on. We need to repent from those things and we need to move on and do what is right in the sight of the Lord. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ's work through his word is to purify us so that there is no spot nor wrinkle, we're told in Ephesians chapter 5. He does that through the word of God and he wants to purify us and it's the individual the church that needs to be purified as well as the church needs to be purified. G. Morgan Campbell said his remarkable thing that the church of Christ persecuted has been the church of Christ pure. The church of Christ patronised has been the church of Christ impure. Interesting, because Ephesus was in a time, this church was at a time of persecution, great persecution, within the city and from without. Christians were being persecuted. And so we see that they were a more pure church. Yes, they had some problems, but they were a good church, a pure church that wanted to do things right, but they had a wrong motive. 
We see in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 2 that the address is unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, the messenger. Now whether this be an angelic being or whether it be to the actual um, uh, pastor of that church or leadership of that church, uh, we're not told. But either way, this was a warning uh, to the church of Ephesus. And in fact, each one of these addresses is addressed to the angel or the messenger of the church. So let's have a look at Ephesus and get a little bit of background. Ephesus, of course, was in Asia because this is to the seven churches of Asia. It was near the river Caesar and um, <clears throat> the, it, is, it was a, a very important capital city in the area. A lot of trade went through that city. It was the end of the road that came from the east and a lot of trade went out through the port um, going west. And so we see that uh, there was a lot of trade, a very rich city if you like. Uh, it was the home of uh, the uh, pro-council uh, government and uh, so it was an important city, it had a powerful city. But it was also uh, a city that housed the um, great temple of Diana. And this was among the seven wonders of the ancient world. And uh, <coughs> Ephesus called herself the keeper of that temple or, or of Diana and the worship there. There was a man who described that temple, Canon Farah, and he said it had been built with ungrudging magnificence out of the contribution furnished by all of Asia and every woman contributing to it with their jewels. To avoid the danger of earthquake, its foundations were built at vast cost on artificial foundations of skin and charcoal and wood laid over the marsh. You see, it was put on the marsh so that if an earthquake came, there was a bit of a shock absorber effect. And it withstood many earthquakes. It gleamed, we are told, um, like a star from a distance. It had 120 pillars that were hewn out of very expensive marble. Some of the pillars were carved with designs of exquisite beauty. The roof itself was of cedar wood supported by columns of jasper uh, on the basis of these uh, Purity marble. On these pillars hung gifts of priceless value. It was a magnificent structure of magnificent proportions. The form, the actual form of Diana itself was said to have come down from heaven. The idol itself was uh, depicted as a multi-breasted woman holding a club in one hand and a trident in the other. She was the goddess of utility. Her worship was characterised like a lot of heathen and pagan religions was that of prostitution and um, uh, great erotic wickedness. The silversmiths of Ephesus carried out a very lucrative business and uh, they sold images of the goddess so that people could worship them. In Acts 19.23, we know that they kicked up a very, very big stink because Paul had been preaching the gospel and people had destroyed a lot of their artefacts by fire because they had become Christians. They'd seen what God had done in that city. It was also wicked, cultish and satanic. And we see that in the burning of all those things that they brought out. The expense was a phenomenal expense. Turn with me to Acts chapter 19. And verse 19. And it said, let's look at 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds 
Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. I've got written in my Bible that this, this silver was something in the equivalent of 150 men's wages for a year. Something in the vicinity of about $477,000 in today's money. But in those money, that was about uh, 150 men's wage for a year. That's a lot of money. And so we have this wicked city. But in this city, we have contrasted the Christianity that was founded in that city by the Apostle Paul. And from this city, it spread out to areas around. Paul didn't visit Colossae, but people from Ephesus did, and people were converted, and a church was formed in Colossae. And so we see a wonderful movement of the gospel from this place. That was the city. That was the background of it. Now let's have a look at the character of Christ. In chapter 1 of John, I'm sorry, in chapter 1, John tells us of the vision that he witnessed of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He recognised Jesus as a man, but John saw him in all his glory. You see, he was the Son of Man, but he saw the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and heard him witness of himself. In John, sorry, Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says um, that he was the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. In the remainder of that verse it says, He that which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty, is recognised as the Almighty. Revelation 1.18, He that liveth and was dead, Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, he recognised him as that. And he that what the he that is alive and will be forevermore. In that chapter we saw his apparel and we saw his appearance and we saw the beauty of the glorified Christ. I encourage you to read Revelation chapter 1, that account of the glorified Christ. We saw that he walked in the midst of the candlesticks and those candlesticks were represented in those seven churches which were in Asia. It actually gives us the interpretation of that later on in the chapter. And also that he held in his hand the stars or the angels or the ministers of God in those places. And God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has control in the church. Amen? But he should have because he has the preeminence. He is the head of the church. And we need to recognise him and acknowledge him as such. But Jesus Christ in the midst, he can turn at any time and knows everything that's going on at once. And so he sees and he has a good handle on what those churches were like. And he has a good handle on what this church is like. He has got a good handle and knows exactly what we as individuals of this church are like. Jesus Christ, the preeminent one. And we see here that he has been acknowledged as he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. That is the characteristic of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ that was given to the church at Ephesus. And because Christ knew all these things, he knew their works. You see, Ephesus was a serving church. See it there in verse 2? I know thy works, and thy labour, and thy patience, and, thou, uh, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. You see, 
God knew their service. God knew their works. Their works and their labour. Their works was to toil to the point of exhaustion. I don't know whether, you, whether you've ever had that before, but there have been days when I have toiled to the point of exhaustion. It doesn't take so long to get exhausted these days, though. The other day I was on the end of a crowbar for a couple of hours and it soon knocked me up. I could be on a crowbar all day and it, and it would take all day to, to knock me up, but a couple of hours pulled me up uh, just recently. What we have to realise is that these guys were serving Christ to the point of exhaustion. And God is not condemning that, he's commending that. And to labour, intense labour, united with trouble, trouble and toil, it says there. And we know that the Ephesians, even though they were being uh, inflicted with punishment and were being persecuted, they kept on serving God. They kept on. And we certainly know of the troubles that they had in the book of Acts. You see, the silversmiths became very vocal and they wanted to destroy Paul and they wanted to destroy Christianity. Because they were losing their money, their filthy lucre, from the false idols that they were producing. They were producing images and saying you could pray to those images. How ridiculous. We need to pray to someone who is living. We need to pray to the living God. The God of the Bible. We have to remember that 30 years on from that time is when John was writing with his church. I don't think the persecution had lessened any. I think, in fact, it may have increased because they would have been the silversmiths. There would have been possibly Jewish men that uh, wouldn't go into, uh, wouldn't uh, embrace the Lord Jesus Christ at the side, that they were inflicted in the church, and we knew that there was Roman persecution, which was very pronounced. And yet they kept on serving the Lord. Their works were fervent works. They were a busy church. They were involved in serving. As I said before, there were a, a number of people being saved. Those that were passing through and those that were within the city of Ephesus were being saved. And if there's souls being saved, there must have been some sort of evangelism going on. That takes work. But it's a blessing. There were baptisms being had. They had to be organised. There was discipleship and encouragement and teaching the word. You can't just say, be saved, and just, way you go. They're babes in Christ. They need to be encouraged. They need to be given the sincere milk of the word. There was ministering going on. Just like in Acts chapter 2, they that gladly received his word were baptised the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. You see, they were taught doctrine. They were encouraged in fellowship. And there was communion and prayers and they were baptised. Those that received the word gladly. Things were going on in the early church. Things were going on in the church of Ephesus. And there would have been many people involved in them. And God praised the labour of the people at Ephesus. Why? Because that's what he wants us to do for him. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and 10, it says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is our salvation. But in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, under good works, 
which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has ordained that every believer should do service for him. Where should that service be done? I believe it should be in the church. Not necessarily from the church, but from the church going out. Because God has given us that. You know, it is important to do that. God says it's not a vain thing to serve the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. We need to labour in the Lord. And even though we do it to the point of exhaustion, we need to be not weary in well-doing. That means we need to keep on keeping on. Galatians 6 and verse 9, 2 Thessalonians 3, 13. But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. We need to be continuing on. We need to be faithful like a faithful steward with the service of the Lord. You know, when we reach heaven, nothing better than God saying, well done, they're good and faithful servant. Amen? What a blessing that would be. But I want to ask you this thing. When was the last time that you laboured for the Lord? When was the last time that you laboured to the point of exhaustion? I know some of us do. I know some of us dear wife is one of those, she wouldn't hate me for saying this, but even when she's not well she's still cooking meals for people. She's still down here cleaning the church. She's not that well. But she's still serving the Lord. That's the love she has for you. How are you serving him? How are you serving the Lord Jesus Christ? To what degree would you go to serve him? These are all good questions to ask. Because we need to ask ourselves, because God says, I know thy works and thy labour. And he reward he will reward them. <coughs> He's commending them for that. But not only did they have works, they were sound and as they were a sound and separated church. They were a serving church and they were a sound and separated church. I know thy works and thy labour and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them that are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found their lives. Ephesus was a church that could not bear the workers of wickedness. They separated themselves from them. They had to. Think about it. They had to separate themselves from that wicked, uh, idolatrous, uh, erotic place of worship of Diana. They couldn't go there. They needed to separate from those worldly practices, those wicked practices. Otherwise, those wicked practices would come into the church. We need to be careful of those things. You see, the church has become more worldly as the time has passed. We went back to the time of Ephesus and they walked in here and saw how we operated. I wonder what they would think. I wonder if they would be happy if they had a view, I wonder if the Lord is happy. That's more important, amen? I wonder if the Lord is happy with the way that we go on. Dr. Pearson said, I, when he was asked about the conversion of the world, he said, I admit the world has become a little bit churchy. 
But the church had become immensely worldly. What a stain that comment has on the church. And I think it's very true of the modern day. You see, the Reformed Church is trying to make the world a little bit churchy because they're trying to usher in the kingdom. It's not happening. Things are getting worse, not better. When we view the news, things are not getting better. They're getting far worse. More stabbings, more shootings, more murders, more rapes, more indecent assaults. The police, the jails, they just can't keep up with them. Our world is getting worse, just like the Bible says. You see, the church needs to be in the world, but not of the world. It needs to be different from the world. Tozer said the church's mightiest influence is felt when she is different from the world in which she lives. So power lies in her being different rises with degree in which she, is, which she differs and sinks as the difference diminishes. Our effect in the world is sinking because we're not that different. We need to be different. This has been a challenge going through this, this, this passage to me. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17 and 18 says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be son, uh, ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. We need to invite sinners to embrace Christ. We need to invite them to come out of the world. We shouldn't be going into the world to try and rescue them. I don't mean that we don't go down the street and talk to people. I don't mean that we don't go into the world, into the workplace and try and tell them, but we need to invite them to come to Christ. We need to say, Jesus is the only one to save you. And when they're saved, bring them in. They need to come out of the world. They can't stay in the world. They need to come out. I'll illustrate this with a believer who was saved out of drunkenness. A person that I know of. And he wanted his friends to be saved. He'd been saved out of the pub life. But he went back to the pubs to tell them the gospel. Wrong place for him to be. Wrong place for him to be. And his friends started to give him a hard time. His friends started to say, one beer won't hurt. <coughs> His friends started to say, come on mate, it'll be okay, have one. And before long, he was in a worse place than when he was before he was saved. Did he lose his salvation? Not if he was truly saved. But he was in the wrong place. You see, he returned to the vomit, he returned to the mire, from which he'd been saved from. What a sad place to be. You see, this gospel needs to separate. We need to go from light to darkness. Isn't that what it says in the book of Colossians? That we are taken from darkness and God brings us into the kingdom of light. Darkness to light unbelief to belief, from sin to righteousness, from death to life, from the devil to God. God brings us out of those things and into something far better. And we need to be challenging people from the sidelines to bring them out. You see, you can't save somebody from a sinking boat if you're in the sinking boat yourself. You need to be in a sound vessel. And you need that person to come onto that sound vessel. We need to be on firm ground. This is what I tell kids as far as life saving is concerned. I warn them, I say, if you see someone in the river that's struggling and drowning, 
don't dive in after them and go up to them because they will try and push you under. And that's what the sinner does. They want to push you under. They want to take you with. They want to save themselves. They want to justify their actions, if you like. That's what sinner does. By trying to get you in the same place. You need to stay on the bank and throw them something that floats. If you can't throw that far, even the fact that if you swim out with something that floats and you hand them the thing that floats, don't go near them. Best if you do stay on the bank. Best if you do stay on firm ground and throw them a rope. Throw them a lifeline and drag them to shore where you both can be safe. You see, the people, the church at Ephesus, they hated, they could not bear that which were evil. Not tolerated. This also brings us to the point of church discipline, doesn't it? Separation and church discipline is not taught in churches a lot. We, need, we are told to avoid some certain people. We are told to put them out. We are told to put them, deliver them to Satan. That sounds really bad, doesn't it? But that basically means put them out of the church. Fortunately, we've had to do that here. But we need to realise that this is done because of the church. It's been done because of Christ. And it's to be done because of that person that's been put out. So that they realise that they are not walking with the Lord, that they need to change. There needs to be church discipline at times. Not only did they hate evil, but they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And they were on the right point when they were hating the Nicolaitans. Why? Because God hated them too. He hated what they were doing. Those deeds were hated by them. We need to be warned about those things. You see, these guys were false teachers. They said that they were uh, apostles, some of them. They were liars. And the church at Ephesus had taken the warning of Paul. In Acts chapter 20, Paul went to the elders of Ephesus and said, I'm going away and there are going to be grievous wolves that come in among you and are going to try and rip you apart. A wolf is not kind to the sheep. A wolf kills sheep. A wolf destroys the lambs. And that's what they were trying to do, these Nicolaitans. What were they? What were they doing? Nicolaitans mean destruction of the people. And maybe that was relating to the doctrine of Balim, or Balaam, who said, lead them back into idolatry, get them to sacrifice sacrifices to the idols, get them to intermarry Jewish people with the heathen people so that the heathen people, their spouse, can encourage them to do the wrong thing. This is why we encourage young Christians to marry Christian people. Because what happens when they don't, that the other one leads them away from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the doctrine of Allah, and we're going to look at that more in detail. But some believe that it was uh, those that followed a deacon, Nicholas, who had uh, unre who taught unrestrained indulgence. You can do whatever you like. Some believe that during, due to the name destruction of the people, that it was the clergy lording it over the people. Like in John 3, Diotrephes, who liked to have the preeminence and wanted to lord it over the people and tell them exactly what they had to do all the time. 
not letting the Holy Spirit deal with them. You see, the Ephesian church hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. They hated the false teachers. You know, they tried the spirits, so to speak, to make sure that they were doing and teaching the right thing. I want you to try the spirits here in this pulpit. If I preach something that is not according to the scriptures, you need to tell me, you need to tell John, you need to tell Joshua, and we need to deal with that. Don't spread it around the church and gossip. But tell those three, tell us three men. And let's sit down and talk about it and go through the scriptures together because I want to get it right. And I hope that you want me to get it right. It's important that we get it right. But we need to hate those things that God hates. Amen? We need to hate those things that God sees as an abomination. He tells us those things. Not the people that do them, but the deeds. That's what the, the Ephesians hated. They didn't like. We need to love what God loves. God commends them on that. I want to ask you to close. Do you love the things that God loves truly? And do you hate the things that God hates? Because it will come out in their actions. I want to tell you too. Tell you too the thing that God has been working in my heart in some of these areas too. And I hope He's working in your heart as well. Because we need to get it right. We need to have a church that is going the way that God wants it to go. Church that is pure so that the spots and wrinkles, so to speak, that are talked about in Ephesians chapter 5 are right now. Are right now. Let us pray.